Those of you who don't know me, my name is David Mendoza. I'm the campus pastor of our TFC Westlake campus. Yeah. Uh, thank you. <laughs> it's an absolute pleasure to be here with you guys uh, aboard the mothership, like I always say. And uh, I have a message for you guys. I'm just happy to be here once again. I'm encouraged to see so many smiling faces, so many friends, so many friends just kind of seeing you guys again. I don't come here very often, but I do get the chance to come here, and I had forgotten how big this campus is. So there is a lot of people here, and my knees are getting a bit queasy. So like if, I, my, if my legs give, you know, just give me a minute, I'll get back up. All right, so here we go. I have a scripture for you guys. I want to spend some time in the Word with you, Mark 12, 28 through 31, if you have your Bibles. If not, we have a big electronic one for you. Mark 12, 28 through 31 says this. One of the teachers of religious law was standing there listening to the debate, and he realized that Jesus had answered well. So he asked, of all the commandments, which is the most important? Uh, Jesus replied, the most important commandment is this. Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one and only Lord. Verse 30, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. Today, I'd like to title today's uh, topic or today's conversation, Says Who? Turn to your neighbor and say, Says Who? Says Who? Let's go ahead and pray. Father God, thank you once again for the opportunity to be here. Thank you for this time together in family and in friendship and fellowship, Dad, and worship. Father, I thank you for everybody who is in the house this morning, this afternoon. I thank you for the fact that they are here. I thank you that you care for each and every single one of us. As we enter into the word, Father, I pray that we have soft hearts, pliable spirits to receive what you have for us this morning. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen, amen. amen. So, how many of you guys have ever heard the phrase, uh, someone is in the zone? In the zone, nice and high for me, in the zone. Uh, that normally means that you're doing well or something is going on. Maybe you're in sports, maybe you're doing an activity and you kind of get in the zone. Things go well. I uh, used to bowl a lot. You know, some person laughed. <laughs> bowling, does anybody like bowling like I do? <laughs> Come on, bowlers, there you go. Yeah, my, my brethren. Uh, I used to love bowling. Uh, quite, I used to do it quite a bit, actually. I was a little bit obsessed with it. I had to go away from that because I had kids and I couldn't spend any more money on myself. But uh, I used to love bowling bowling. I actually do own a pair of bowling balls. They're at home, and their names are Lucille and Charlene. And they have served me well over the last few years. If you're a bowler at all, you know what the best score you can get in a bowling uh, game or a game of bowling is what? 300. You, hit, you knock down the pins down every single time. I'm very proud of the fact that I once got a 236. Woo, here's my tattoo. It says 236 right here on my arm. <laughs> in those moments, I was in the zone. I remember going to bowl, and I'm not going to do, you know that goofy move that you do? I'm not going to do it for you because it's weird. But, you know, I was bowling, and, and I was, man, I was hitting everything. I was doing so well. Had some friends with me. My friends started kind of quieting down after a while. They're like, oh, he's in the zone. Like, Shh, don't bother him. He's killing this. Don't bother him. And everybody kind of knew that I was kind of in this space where like everything was just clicking. Maybe you're at work. Maybe you're in sports. Maybe you're an artist. Maybe you're a musician. You might know what I mean when I say the zone. I mean that you're doing something and you're just kind of doing it well. There's a flow. There's a rhythm. There's just kind of things are working for you. And, and it feels great when you're in the zone because you just know that it's almost like you can't do anything wrong. You, you're just like, man, I'm, this is just clicking along and I'm excited for it. Great feeling the zone. I like the verse that I just gave you, uh, one of my favorite verses, because I believe that we can actually live in a very Christian-like zone. I believe that as people of faith, we can live in the zone, in our faith zone, in some point where things are just clicking, where things are working, where things are moving, where we're just experiencing God's love in a great and amazing way. And this verse that I just read to you guys in Mark is actually my favorite verse. Actually, that's not it. I was at uh, Daddy-Daughter Date Night the other day, man in the house. Yeah. Woo, I dated my daughters. I have, a, I have four kids. I have a pile of kids. I have four kids. If you don't know me, I have four kids. I have a son, and I have three daughters. Pray for me. And I took my three daughters to daddy-daughter date night, and we had a questionnaire there, and the questionnaire said, uh, what's your favorite verse? And of course, I'm a preacher, so I do have a favorite verse. It's actually Matthew 22. It's actually the same event in a different gospel. Some guy goes up to Jesus and says, hey, Jesus, uh, can you tell me the most important thing I should know in Scripture? Basically, you're saying, out of all the 600 plus laws and commandments and thou shalt nots and things that I shouldn't do, can you just give me the, the, the cliff notes for that, Jesus? And just tell me the one most important one. Can you do that for me? 
And Jesus, it sounds almost like a preposterous question. Basically saying, can you summarize the Bible up for me yeah. in one? Sounds kind of like a dumb question or like a preposterous question. The funny thing is Jesus answered it. Jesus is like, yeah, I can do that. You ready? Maybe you don't know this today and I'm going I'm to rock your world. Do you know what the most important thing in the Bible is? If you read the whole thing, you can be a scholar. If you don't get this, you missed it. You can read it from front to back and just be able to quote scripture like crazy. If you missed this one thing, you missed it. What is the most important thing in scripture? And Jesus says, yeah, I can answer that. Live God with everything. Amen. That's it. Love God with your heart, soul, mind, everything that you are. And then he says, hey, but I'll give you a freebie too, just in case you're confused. I'll give you the second one too. He says, love God with everything and love neighbor as yourself. This is a massive uh, section of scripture for me. It absolutely changed my life. I believe that this flow, exactly what he said here, it's God, neighbor, and self, right? Love God, love neighbor as yourself. So you got to love you too. You got to love you, boo-boo. That's okay. Like, I'm not going to just, you know, self-hate. You do you, right? You got to love you. So it's love God, love neighbor, love self. And that flow right there is very important. I believe if you get this flow right, if you live in this flow, love God, love neighbor, love self, then life can be lived in the zone. We can live a, a, a real, weighty, beautiful faith because we're, we're living in the zone. As God loves you, as you learn to receive God's love, you love yourself more. And as you love yourself more, you love him more. And also you love your neighbor as the neighbor receives your love, he learns to love God and he learns to love you. It's a beautiful little flow. Very important. This is something so key to the Christian walk. And I think it's so important for me because I, I mean, I'm up here. I'm having a great time, by the way, at the family church over on our Wesleyco campus. I'm, 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 honestly, man, I spend a lot of time laughing with them, just enjoying. God is doing an amazing work, not only at our Wesleyco campus, but even here, amen. God is just awesome. I'm seeing transformation. It's exciting. There was a time in my life where I didn't care about people. Anybody else in the Don't raise your hand, we'll get weird. Okay, some people are like, yeah, me, I'll, I'll own it, right? I hate these people. <laughs> I didn't like people very much. I just didn't like, I'm kind of an introvert if you know me, especially if you know me from on the stage and not off the stage, I'm a little bit of an introvert, but overall, I learned to love people. I didn't really like people before. Just kind of cared about myself, cared about relationships, but I got to know a little bit more of God. I got to experience his love for me. And I'll go into that a little bit later, but I got to experience how much God loves me. And as a result, I learned to love myself more. Uh, uh, not in a selfish, weird, like, I don't care about anybody but me, taking care of myself and rejecting relationships and hurting people type of love, no. I, love, I learned to love myself and see myself as God sees me. And as I did that, man, life, life took on a different flavor. <laughs> Uh, joy started bubbling up, amen. Can, can somebody agree with this? Joy started bubbling up. And, and man, God loves me. And, I, and man, I'm in love with God, and this is great. And in the middle of that, God started showing me love for others. I didn't just generate it from myself, because like I said, I, sometimes I couldn't stand people. But as I started loving God, then all of a sudden I started caring about others. And, and for me, this is a massive thing. If you've ever heard me preach before, I'm always talking about how we need to love the world, because it says in Scripture, how we love each other will show the world who God is. So I'm very big on like, you should love God, you should love the world, but you should also love yourself. Yeah. You should also be happy with yourself. And if you get these three things right in sync, and it's a, it's a, it's a, you don't have to have all one before you can do another. It's a flow, it's a flow, it's a daily flow. Just going back and forth, loving others, loving self, loving God, and so forth. If you can get this right, I think we'll be all right. I think we'll be all right as faith people. But I also believe that that's where the attack comes from. I feel that if we can get this right, man, we're going to kill this Christian thing. <laughs> we're going to do great. But I also know that that's where I feel the attack can come from. Because how many of you guys know we have an adversary who does not want you living in that zone? He wants you to feel that you're not loved. He doesn't want you to love your creator. He doesn't want you to love your neighbor. He wants you to lead a selfish life full of problems so you see nobody else but yourself. He does this. And, and honestly, I'm going to kind of talk about the schemes of the devil a little bit today. So I hope that they bring revelation and you can kind of say to yourself, wow, yeah, that's actually very true. It's an old trick that he does. He's pretty uh, predictable. Our enemy, uh, the adversary, is pretty predictable. He's a, he's a liar. He's a thief. He steals. He wants to hurt. But it's, his methods aren't that hard to see once you see them. So I'm going to show you a little bit of that today. Let's go back to Genesis 3. Like I said, I'm going to go all the way to the beginning, Genesis, to show you. He's been doing it since then, and he hasn't stopped. 
So this is what the adversary, uh, uh, like Pastor John said a week ago in Ephesians 6, our adversary, the, 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 the principalities of this world, the spirits of this world are our are, are, are adversary. This is what he does to separate us from God's flow, from the zone per se. Uh, Genesis 3. The serpent, there is, was the shrewdest of all wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Uh, verse 7, we all know she, uh, that she ate it along with Adam. They both ate it. They both sinned. Let's go to verse 7 so you can see what happens. At that moment, their eyes were open, and then suddenly they felt, what's that word? Shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. So they hid from, among the, Lord, uh, from the Lord God among the trees. Picture this, if you will. Adam and Eve in the garden uh, for birthday suit status. Like, you know, birthday suiting it up. There's nothing on. They're just chill. Who cares? They're fine. They're loving God. They're fully in, uh, in love with God. They're receiving his love. They give him love 100% complete. There's nothing wrong with their life. So I said a minute ago, our adversary, the devil, is going to try some things to break that, to kind of get in the way. And in a nutshell, I'm going to kind of unpack it a little bit, but in a nutshell, here's the word you need to remember about the schemes of the devil or just our, our adversary and our sinful nature. Here's the word you need to remember. Separation. Separation. He wants to separate you from God, his people, and his purposes so that you don't live in the flow. He did it from the beginning. They, like you said, they, they were there. He, he gave them one directive. Don't eat of that tree. Don't eat the fruit from that one. You're going to have everything else. Just don't do this one. The enemy shows up and says, is that really what he said? Is that re- Come on. It doesn't really mean that, right? Like, you know, the pastor said we shouldn't do this. But does he really mean that? Is that old-fashioned? God doesn't know what he's talking about. Maybe that was for another time. Because now in 2019, we, we know everything. We got Google. We're good. We know everything. It, it, it's, disobedience to God has, wrecked ha- was, has wreaked havoc over thousands of years. But in 2019, we got to figure it out. Come on. Is that really what he said? The way he separates us from God's will for our life, I'm going to give you two things. I'm gonna, I, I encourage you, if you want to write stuff down, I encourage you to write stuff down on your phone. I don't want to see myself on Facebook Live, though. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying, because like, the angles are weird. <laughs> uh, you can write stuff down. So uh, this is the first point that I want to encourage you on, okay? The, the, the enemy will try to separate you from God's love through your own disobedience. Just being disobedient. God says one thing, we're like, nah, and we do it our way. And it's, it, it's an old trick. He did it to her. He did it to Eve. He did it to Adam. Did he really say that? That's not what he meant. You're fine. Do it your way. And then we do that, and all of a sudden we experience the pain of disobedience, right? Uh, maybe there's some people in the house who have gone through some tough times relationally with family, with friends, and the scripture says, hey, look, you've got to be forgiving. You can't hold on to, to, to offense. If you're married, this is how you do marriage. This is how you treat your wife. This is how you treat your husband. These, these are the commandments of God. And, we're, and we read those, and maybe we can come to the house and we're like, nah, <laughs> nah, I'll just let forgiveness sit there forever and wreck my life. And then 20 years later, I'm still holding on to something that happened in the 80s. Right? And, and, and what he does there is that he kind of causes you to disobey. We experience the pain of disobedience, and now all of a sudden we have trouble really living in that flow. We can't love neighbor. Why would we love neighbor? We can't even get over our 80s mishap. We can't get over the pain of our 90s, of our 2000s, right? But the, 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 the 2020, that's going to be the beginning of something different. No, you know, we hold on to these things. Disobedience causes us to kind of live in a weird, like, small world. It's just about us. It's hard to love God because we don't even love ourselves. It's hard to love neighbor. So the flow, the zone of our faith is completely interrupted because we're just being disobedient. Amen. So that's one of the easiest things that he does. He says, hey, uh, I'm going to separate you from God's best for you because I'm going to try to convince you that, God's, that your way is better than what God does. That in 2019, Internet Access has given you all the right answers. And uh, you can just do life your way. If we're not careful, we fall into that trap. It's an old trick. But how many of you guys know we fall for it? Amen? Or just the pastor? (laughs) 
we fall for it. And the second one is tied to it. L- l- notice that, that in the scripture it actually says that when they first ate of the fruit, they covered themselves. Like I said, they were doing their birthday suit with no problem whatsoever. <laughs> but then all of a sudden they were like, <gasps> that something, something happened when they ate the fruit that caused them to feel this. And this is the next one. Separation through disobedience. But he also separates you through shame. Shame. Anybody ever felt what it's like to feel ashamed of what you've done? Anybody? I don't know what you do with your Saturday nights. Today's Sunday. <laughs> uh, maybe you were, you know, doing stuff last night. I don't want to be too specific, but let's just say you weren't being obedient to God's call for your life. And you were out there, you know, just, you know. <laughs> yeah, fill in the blank. And you're out there doing your thing, and then Sunday morning rolls around, and, and people are like, let's go to church, we got to get to church, got to go to the house, right? And, and they're excited about it. And, and you yourself, because of what you did last night, or maybe this week, you don't feel comfortable in this room. Because you think that somehow what you've done makes you dirty, makes you want to hide. So it's not easy to come to church sometimes when you had a rough Saturday night, or even a rough Sunday morning. <laughs> Because you're thinking, like, I gotta go to work, I gotta go to church, but th- there's Christians there. And I don't feel like a Christian, I feel like a dirty sinner. Let me kind of put that to bed for you. I would rather have this room full of dirty sinners than self righteous Christians who don't think that they need to God. I want you to steal my wallet. <laughs> Somebody said that to me the other day in Westlake, we lost something, and I'm like, hey, they stole it? Yeah, they stole it from the chair. Cool. <laughs> that means we have the right people in here. I'm not saying to steal, relax, like everybody's like, what? (laughs) What I'm saying is that I want people who are struggling with sin because this is the place to be. But the devil somehow convinces you that through your disobedience, you're you're broken and you should hide and you shouldn't be in this place. There's shame. You start feeling bad for yourself. And then God starts speaking into your life. I love you, son or daughter. I have a purpose for you. And you're like, no, it doesn't really mean me because I'm broken. And we hide from him. And the voice of God doesn't really do the work that it's supposed to do in our life. It doesn't take root. It doesn't produce fruit. Because all we hear is the voice of ourselves telling us we're not good enough. And that's what I'm going to talk about a little bit more. So separation from God and one of the tricks that the enemy does. And like I said, once you see it, it's almost comical. It's almost funny. It isn't funny when you're going through it. <laughs> but it's almost funny how, how it's pretty straightforward. He doesn't want you here. He doesn't want you close to God. He doesn't want you close to brothers and sisters. He's going to separate you. He's going to make you feel like if you're different than everybody else. And what I'm saying is he's a liar. And he's lying to you. So God responds. Let's go back to Genesis 3. God responds to this attack of the devil on his, on his children. And the Lord God called to the man and he says, hey, where are you? He doesn't say, hey, I just threw that in there for fun. He replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. See, he was, he was ashamed. He, the shame came in. This is the most important thing that, out of this lesson. To hope, if, you, if you hear nothing else, pay attention to this next part. Verse 11. Look at the question that Jesus asks, or, or God asks. Who told you that you were naked? A lot of times we can read scripture, we can just blow right past scripture. We read it over and over again and we just miss it. Notice the question. Who told you that? Awesome question. I'm going to get into that a little bit. The Lord God asked, have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? See, the reason why I'm up here at Family Church today on this July 21st, is what the day is? Okay, July 21st. The reason why I'm up here, and this is completely transparently and honest, everybody in the back of the room over here, you see people in the back, I love you guys, people in the back, people in the back, people at the far reaches of our room. The reason why I'm here is because from the very far reaches of this room, all you back there, all you up here, I believe that every single one of you has more for your life in God. That's why I'm here. Every single one of you. I don't care what you've been through. I don't care what you did last night. I don't care if you didn't want to come. I don't care if you were dragged here. If you're in this room, I'm talking directly to you. I believe God has more for you than what you're doing right now. Everybody. I believe this. This is, this is what I truly believe. But, but as we learn to live in that flow, learn to live in that purpose, the devil will come in and try to separate you through disobedience, through shame, and then God responds. I love this. And I want you to write this, this, this down if you're writing stuff down. This is one of the things that I want you to integrate into your life from now on. Here's the question. He asked him a question, and I want you to ask yourself that question. Who told you that? That one question, properly timed, 
can transform your life. You're sitting here thinking, okay, man, this guy's really getting in my face about it. I was back here, I was trying to hide, but he saw me. He made eye contact with me from way over there. <laughs> yeah, cause it, uh, right? Like I, I was trying to just kind of be in the background on a Sunday morning. I didn't want to get involved, but you know what? Uh, there, there, I, I'm just not sure. This faith thing, I get it. I'm not, sure. I'm not sure if I believe in the church. The church, I've seen it do some bad things. I'm not sure if I'm, I've made too many mistakes. Here's the question. Who told you that? Yeah. Says Who? That's the core of it. Says who? God shows up and says, where are you? I'm hiding from you because of my own shame, because of what I've done. Says who? Who told you you're supposed to hide from me? Who told you you were disqualified? Who is talking to you in your head that says that somehow you're broken and everybody else is called but you? Who said that? Who told you that? We're weird. We're like, oh, well, I, I, it's somewhere in my head. <laughs> Somebody's talking to me. Yeah, somebody is talking to you. And this is the funny thing. Somebody definitely is talking to you. <laughs> but we're, we're funny. The, the, one of the, it's almost comical, like I said, but it's one of the most frustrating things as a pastor that I see. And this is my heart for the church. God has so much for each and every single one of us. But because of sin, our self-talk self-sabotages And the funny thing is that you, your, your voice will tell you, no, it's just that you were at, on, you know, I don't even know what street it is, where all the bars are. Does anybody know? <laughs> no, what, what, who? Somewhere over there. You were down there. <laughs> you were down there and you wrecked your life. And then you come here and something in your head says, you're not supposed to be here. You're a hypocrite. Right? And that, that voice comes from somewhere. And what God is saying is like, who's, who's actually talking to you in that moment? Who's talking to you? That's why I like this question so much. Do you know who's talking to you there? Who is that? If it was a different voice that wasn't your own, like if it was me and, and all of a sudden I heard a lady's voice in my head, yeah. David, you're not worthy. <laughs> It'd be no problem be like, what? Who's that? And I would immediately reject that voice, right? Because it's not my own voice. Here's the trick. Somehow through sinful nature and through the fruit, the devil has convinced us that his voice is your own. And he'll speak to you and you'll be like, you're not good enough. And all you hear is you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If it was another voice, you'd be like, what was that about? I'm going to reject that in the name of Jesus. But you didn't hear another voice. You heard your own. Yeah. So you're like, yeah. Yeah, I'm not good enough. Who says who? That's the importance of the question. Says who? Who are you listening to? Oh, it's just, David, I wrecked my marriage and I'm here and my kids are just... Yeah, disobedience has its consequence, right? Oh, my kids and my, 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 this person that I cared about a lot, I've isolated them and I'm, I'm separated from them today because of my disobedience. And as a result, my life is incomplete. The promises of God are null. Somehow I'm broken and this is just going to be my life until, until this is over. Says who? Come on. Who told you that? See, it's very important the ability for us to hear what we're really hearing. <laughs> like, who's talking? Uh, this is the trick that, that, that we do to ourselves. I'll share a quick story with you guys. When I was younger, uh, I grew up in a, in a faith family. My dad was a pastor. Any pastor's kids in the house? Come on, somebody. Somebody help me out. Amen. Pray for these people. <laughs> yeah, hey, I'm a pastor's kid. And I, I know exactly what it is. So, hey, pastor's kids, I love you. I was a pastor's kid. My dad took me into the, into the room one time, and he was like, you know what, David? Like, God has a plan for you. He didn't really say that like because he's Hispanic. He was more just like, mijo, porto te bien, right? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, dad, or whatever. And he's like, you know, maybe God, and, and he was trying to tell me that God had a plan for me. But I was just listening there and, and just kind of doing, I was a teenager, I knew everything. I mean, I was pushing 15 at that time, so smart. And he's talking to me and I'm just listening to him and, and the voice, my own voice comes in and says, nah, nah, that's you, dad. That's not me, that's you. Uh, I just want to be a congregation member, maybe give my offering, serve on the weekends, just attend church, but not really get involved in what you have for me. That's what I thought to myself. My own voice was telling me that. Where was that coming from? See the sabotage? You see what he does? Disobedience and shame, somehow the vehicle for that is your own voice. So I listened to my own voice and I just kind of did my own thing. I, I disobeyed, I went away from God, and of course, ha 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 ha, disobedience is painful. Right? 
Messed up my life a little bit, came back to the Lord in my 20s, and I went to a men's retreat. Men in the house, men's retreat. Yeah. Went to a men's retreat. Yep. Went to dudes eating. Uh, I went to a men's retreat, and, and then I, I grew up in a Pentecostal church, so we would throw down at the altar. <laughs> and if any Pentecostal people in the house, come on, help me out here. Pentecostal people in the house. Say, we had extended altar time, right? Like modesty blankets and all. Like, we would just throw down, and we, we all came to the altar at the men's retreat, and we, and we were just throwing down, and I was there wrecked, man. I, I, I started, I realized disobedience hurt. I realized what shame was doing to me, and I was isolated from God. He separated me. I wasn't living in the flow. And then I was just wrecked, and the, 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 some guy came to pray for me, and, and I, man, the Holy Spirit, boom, old school, just, bang, it's on the floor. <laughs> wrecked, just wrecked, like, wrecked, mocos, like, just crying, like, everything, just wrecked. The preacher's going, doing his thing, and he's just kind of, the preacher's spitting fire, man. The Pentecostal preachers, come on, somebody, right? Just praying for people, and people are falling, and all these things. And I'm over there, wrecked on the other side of the stage. Then all of a sudden, the preacher's doing this, and he stops. And I was peeking. (laughs) And he stops, and he's like, and I'm on that side of the stage, right? He, He does this. He sees me, and he just does this number. And I was, <laughs> he got it, like, he nailed me. I don't know what happened. He was ignoring everybody but me. And I was just on the floor, and he gets, he gets a couple of guys, gets a couple of his helpers, right, the ushers. Amen, ushers. <laughs> Woo, come on, somebody. <laughs> ushers, help me out with this guy, right? Gets me there. He said, all right, you, sir, pick him up. Pick him up. I get up. <laughs> what? And I remember to this very day, this guy looks at me right in the eye. And he says, you're not supposed to be here, son. And I was like, what does he know? Who are you? Do you know? What do you know? What do you know, right? Like, what do you mean? <laughs> no, you're not supposed to be here. You're supposed to be out there preaching. You're supposed to be talking to a drug addict. You're not supposed to be talking to me. You're supposed to be talking to the lost, the, pain, the pained, people who are broken, people who have lost everything. You're supposed to be talking to them, not to me right now. What are you doing here? Amen. Whoa. All of a sudden, my own voice hit a greater voice. I'm not good enough. That voice just overpowered me in that moment. I, could, I, I didn't even know what to say. I, I, I packed that in. Honestly, I, I didn't, let me finish the story. I didn't say anything. You just touched me again and bang again. <laughs> and then I woke up like five days later, right? That kind of thing. <laughs> I the greater voice of God pushed against my own internal voice and gave me a greater revelation of his heart for me. Amen. See, see, but here's the key. You get that greater revelation of God through the sound of his voice and obeying it. I could just left. I could have been like, cool story, man. Like, who's this guy? And I could have still rejected because how many of you know you can do that? You can just reject some of you have rejected. Some of you have. And 10 years have gone by and you're still rejecting. The, the, the voice has to be obeyed. So I had to kind of take that and, you know, I, I didn't immediately change because, you know, sin is, I was a sinner. I didn't immediately try to just fix everything in my life. But, man, that voice came in so clear. And all of a sudden I understood that I served a God who, had, who was with me in my wandering. See if that makes any sense. He was aware. I was raised in the church. Come on, somebody be raised in the church. Yeah. Put a child in the ways of the, uh, train the child in the ways of God, and he will not depart from them. I always thought that meant I would not depart from him. I've learned it actually means he won't depart from me. Amen. Just walk with me all the time. Saw everything that I did wrong. Every time that shame would come up, he, he would say, no, you're not going to feel shame. I love you. You're mine. I have a purpose for you. The next thing you know, I started obeying, and now I'm here. Now, this isn't about me. Now, this isn't about me. I'm trying to show you something. I'm trying to show you that our own voice, if we're not careful, will lead us into some pretty crazy territory. Because we think it's our own, when it isn't. But the greater voice of God, through obedience, will give you a greater revelation of who he really is. And in that love, you will learn to love yourself. You won't hide. Amen. And you'll love to love your neighbor. And all of a sudden, love will flow properly. Does that make sense? So one more thing, and, and, and I'll start landing the plane, like they say, right? 
One more thing. This means that we have to have a lifetime of selective hearing. A lifetime of selective hearing. Write that down if you have to. You have to listen. You have to be actively listening to what's coming in. And this is going to be your life. You cannot hit auto, autopilot. You cannot just do what you feel. There is no YOLO in the faith. <laughs> there isn't. Uh, okay. Do you receive that today, TFC? Yeah. Do you, like, there's no, there's, you can't just do what you feel. There's, it's a lifetime of listening and selectively obeying the right voice. That's why we're big on the, vo- on the word. Get in the word. Because if, if the devil says, hey, because of what happened to you when you were a kid, you're not good enough. Don't you know that? Are you buying this guy's, are you buying this preacher's stuff? You're buying what he's selling? Maybe for everybody else, but not for you. That's the funny thing. That's what, that's what he tells you, right? But if you don't have the word, you don't know how to battle that. You're like, oh, and you just go by feeling. It's probably right because it sounds like me. Very good argument, me. I'll listen to you, me. <laughs> See, but the word says, no. You're a daughter and son of the king. Yeah. Everything you've done is covered under the blood of Jesus. What disqualification? Who are you listening to? What's robbing you of this? What's robbing you of God's greater purpose for your life? That voice, whatever that voice is, why are you listening to it? Says who? That's what I mean by selective listening. As you're you're talking to yourself, as the word comes in, and that voice will come in. Because it'll happen probably, if it's not happening now, it'll happen in five minutes when you walk out the door. It'll happen pretty much the rest of the week. I want you to really, man, I hope the Holy Spirit is really doing a work in your heart. I want you to pay attention how often that voice is trying to separate you from him. And really we start tagging it as that. And all of a sudden we're like, where did that come from? Pretend it's a lady's voice if you're a man. (laughs) If it's pulling you away from the ways of God, I'm giving you full authority to ignore it. Because God also speaks, but we have to listen. Let me give you one final scripture, and here's what I know. Let's finish our story in Mark 12, 32 to 34. The teacher of religious law replied, well said, teacher. From, me, from the beginning, remember the guy who asked Jesus, like, like give me the cliff notes of the Bible, right? <laughs> Tell me what the most important thing is. Uh, verse 32, the teacher of religious law replied, well said, teacher. Responding to Jesus, that's what he said. He said, you have spoken truth by saying that there is only one God and no other. And I know it is important to love him with all my heart and all my understanding and all my strength and to love my neighbor as myself. This is more important than to offer all of the burnt offerings and sacrifices required in the law. Pause. The guy who asked Jesus the question looks back at Jesus and says, ding, 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 ding. That is 100% correct, Jesus. You're right. It is about God. It is about neighbor. And it is about self. He agreed. Notice this next verse, though. Jesus, realizing how much the man understood, Jesus said to him, you're not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions because he would wreck their life. (laughs) Notice, Jesus responded, it's about loving God, loving neighbor, and loving self. And I've made the case today that you have to be able to listen to God's voice to be able to do that. It's about loving God, loving neighbor, and loving self. The guy agrees. How many of you agree with me? See, the funny thing is, the guy fully agrees, 100% correct. Jesus, ding, 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 ding. You're right. That is the way to do life. But notice what Jesus said. You're not far. What did that mean? You still haven't arrived. See, because it isn't just about agreeing with the pastor. It's not about me, well, Matthew 22, Mark, whatever, like, and you guys are like, yes, he's right. This guy's funny. He's convinced me. He's right. That's the way to do life. It's not just about that. That's part one. You're close now that you understand it. To actually get there, though, you have to do it. You have to do it. You have to live as if Jesus is with you, and you have to complete the cycle. You have to actually do it. You're not far. That's what I find so fascinating about this. Jesus, it was very hard on the religious teachers in those days because those guys were hardcore. Jesus was always like getting mad at them and making whips out of his belt and stuff. And like, you know, just throwing down with these guys. Well, this one guy understood. Jesus, Jesus, it's almost like if Jesus leaned in. Oh, you get it, don't you? 
You agree. And then he still says, but you're not far. I'll say this and I'll wrap up church. This isn't about just agreeing with me. (laughs) This is about living this way. Living in the zone. God loves you. God loves you. He has not abandoned you in your wanderings. He probably knows them better than you do. (laughs) He's with you. He cares for you. He has a plan for you. I don't care what you've gone through. Whatever the voice says, ignore it. Who says? Ignore the voice. God loves you. God has a plan for you. It's a, we receive that love. It allows us to love ourselves. It allows us to love neighbor. And that's how TFC will change the world. That's how we will change the world. By receiving God's love. Really embracing it and living in it. And giving our love to neighbor. Don't let the devil go in there and separate that or try to short change that. He almost tries to short circuit it. And if I may, just I, I know I'm going a little longer than I expected, but if I may, let me just speak. If I may to the room. My heart behind this message, church, is that as your pastor here, one of the pastors here at the family church, I see it in Westlake, I see it, on, I see it, and it, they bring me these really cool stories about how God moves. But for every cool story that I get about how God moves, I also get the stories of people wandering in disobedience and lost because the devil has them trapped in shame. And they look at us and they're like, if I could just do what you do, David, if I could just, hey, I'm not perfect. If I could just kind of get, like, no, 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 no. Like, the, the answer was for the church as, as, a, as a whole. You gotta love God, you gotta love neighbor, and you gotta love self. But when the voice comes in, we have to have the opposite voice telling us no. And that's where this is. I can't walk that out with you. That's my heart behind this. I can't make those decisions for you. I'm not gonna go to that street, down the street, whatever I was talking about earlier with you. (laughs) That's up to you. When the opportunity presents itself, and the self-talk comes in. That's up to you to say no. And that's my heart behind this, because honestly, that's what I get a lot. I get people who, oh, the devil has shame, the devil has caused them to disobey, and they're far from God. And they come and they're like, look, I've been away from faith for 20, 30 years, David, and my life is wrecked. Can you pray for me? And I'm like, I'll pray for you, yeah, because I'm a pastor. Of course I'll pray for you. Yes, I will. But 30 years of wandering, 30 years of obeying only your own voice, it's, it's more than just the pastor putting a hand on you and praying for it to go away. It's a renewing of the mind, like Romans says, right? It's just really understanding why we're wandering, why we're being tricked, and why we keep on falling for the same trick from Genesis 3. And making a decision to say, that's enough of that. That's enough. You are good enough. God does love you. He does have a purpose for each and every single one of you. And he will not stop chasing you. God is awesome. Every head bowed, every eye closed. For me, please, church, if I may. Every head bowed, every eye closed. You're in the room today, and as I've been talking to you, you realize that you start off on the left foot, maybe, and when I say love God and love self, you've never made that decision to accept God as your Lord and Savior. You've never walked with Him. You've never made that decision on your own. Maybe you're walking your parents' faith or your friend's faith or a family member's faith. But if I were to ask you flat out, if this is just a conversation between me and you, Nobody else. Can you tell me with a yes that you've proclaimed faith in Jesus and you've asked him to be your Lord and Savior? You've decided to follow him. Perhaps maybe at one point you did and you've fallen away from faith. You've been disobedient. Life has tossed you around a bit. You've been doing it your own way. And today you feel the Holy Spirit conviction to make the decision and come back. No longer separated, but one. And recommit your life to Jesus. If that's you in the house, proclaiming faith for the first time or coming back to him, can you raise your hand for me so I can see you? It'd be an absolute pleasure to, play, to pray with you. Thank you for those hands. Nice and high for me. Praise God. Praise God. It's an absolute pleasure to pray with you guys today. Nice and high. Anybody else? Anybody else? I'm not in a rush. This is all for this moment anyway. Don't worry. Lunch can wait. Nice, nice and high. Nice and high for me. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Anybody else? You can put your hands down, church. The rest of us, for those of you who raise your hand, I'm going to pray a prayer with you. I want everybody to pray along with me. I don't want anybody to pray alone. If you raise your hand, I want you to take this prayer. This isn't a special prayer. It's not a David prayer. It's just a prayer that gives voice to what's happening in your heart right now. Make this prayer your own because Scripture says what you believe in your heart and you confess with your lips, that's what leads you to salvation. So everybody nice and loud repeat after me. Say, Father God, 
I thank you for your son, Jesus. I thank you that he died for me. At this moment, I ask that you come into my heart and that you save me. Wash all my sins away. Make me brand new. I receive you as my Lord and Savior in the name of Jesus. I thank you that because of my confession, I am forgiven. You live in me, and heaven is my eternal home. I am saved. In the name of Jesus, we all pray. Amen. Amen, church.